No, I mean, architecture is political. We gotta, we gotta add that stuff. Indeed. We are tearing down communities to build multifamily and you have to understand we are creating displacement. You're displacing black and brown folks and they don't come back. Half of this podcast would be dedicated to the history of Tyler House, my journey and my discoveries. And hey, I'm going to solve this housing problem. Hey guys, what's up? My name is Melissa Daniels. This is the Architectural Political Podcast where black and brown folks talk about architecture. I hope you enjoyed this podcast and be part of my it's March time. right now and we're celebrating Women's History Month. I'm sorry. And you're you're probably thinking, well, what happened to Black History Month, Melissa? Well, I celebrate Black History Month 365 days of the year. My content is about black and brown folks so yeah happy women's history month i'm celebrating it because i want to shed light on black women and healthcare, black women and the birth rate the u.s is not doing so good in those numbers and when i came across michelle brower's work i was like this is a topic that we don't really focus on or talk about and that includes the history of us in the u.s how does this relate to architecture melissa well we do design buildings and she is trying to do that she has some property and she wants to build for us fubu Remember that? Flubu for us by us. So it was a really good conversation. I'm totally grateful that she decided to come on. Let me give a disclaimer though. And it's 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 about me too in my life. So this episode was supposed to go out in February to hype up the conference that she's holding. But instead I wanna focus that energy on donations, donating to building this campus. Why did it not go out? Well, a lot has happened to me personally these past couple of weeks that has prevented me from getting this out on the regular. So I do have a backlog. I just haven't been editing and producing as frequently as I would like to. Again, this is a one woman show. I am in a place right now where I could actually focus on and and giving content to you guys. But, but yeah, I want to focus on especially with Michelle's cause and the more up campus and building that and just just helping her achieve the funding so that she could build build for us as black women and women in general but for black women so yeah let's see we talk a little bit about her her upbringing, her life, the mothers of gynecology. I didn't even know there was a father of gynecology. So we get into that. And she's an artist that created three sculptures on the Mora campus. The names are Anarcha, Betsy, and Lucy. If you go on my website, arcuspoly.org, and click on the episode uh, link, you get some videos and you get to see what I'm talking about here. I haven't started season four yet. Okay. Like normally you would start a new season in a new year. And I've done that in the past, in the past three seasons. And I'm I'm kind of stuck right now. I am stuck on season three. And I'm stuck because I don't know what season four looks like. Graphically, I don't know what season four looks like. The content will pretty much be the content that it is. So that's not going to change. But visually, I want season four to look differently. And I don't know what that looks like. So I'm going to be on season three for a little bit. And there's no rules for this. That's the amazing thing. There's no rules for this. There's no, uh, you know, 12 episodes of season three or, you know, 10 episodes each. There's these like rules that we just tend to follow for no reason. So this will be season three until season four. Season three could be two years. I'm not mad at that because every season should be new, should be fresh, right? Like what's the point in creating new seasons if you don't reinvent yourself every single time or not right there's nothing wrong with that either but for me and the season four out of season five I want to do something I I don't know I want to create something I don't know what that looks like 
Is it a new color? Am I going to switch up my my website? Is it a new logo ask? I don't know. Because of life, I just haven't had time to pause and just create. But you will find out soon enough. One more thing I need to mention to you guys before we start this episode. I have the explicit language turned on here and it's not because of cursing but it may trigger some of you guys so there's a trigger warning here it's more of a graphic reason so just be aware we are talking about the female body we are talking about what happens during childbirth and so forth so I just want to make you guys aware of that so but I hope you guys enjoy the episode Another thing I want to note is the audio. The main reason why this episode took so long is because of the audio. Unfortunately, there was some audio challenges that I was not privy to during the recording, but after I went back and listened to it, I obviously I've heard it. So, it took a it took a while to get the audio so you can hear it, and I didn't want to bother Michelle about it her time and then especially when the conference was coming up I didn't want to re-record this so I did as best as I could with the audio so just be mindful of that my voice sounds okay but when you hear hers just be aware of of audulations of sound and then there's this this is a little bit I, I I don't know how else to describe it, but so yeah, just be mindful of that. Again, I tried my best. The content is so good though. I've definitely learned a lot. And again, I hope you come out inspired and, and to, to help a cause, right? Cause we, we need to help each other out and we need to protect black women most importantly. So thank you. And here you go. Hi, Michelle. Hi. How are you? I'm wonderful. How are um, you? I'm thrilled. I love artists. In architecture, artistry is part of that. I'm always in awe, especially Black women as talented as you are. And how you take tragedy, tra- I, that's a hard word for me to say, tragedy into mm-hmm. something that's beautiful and uplifting. Thank you for coming on to talk to me. Thank you for the invitation. Just to let the audience know, who are you? Oh my gosh, you see my photo. It's like a little girl looking over her glasses. Mm-hmm. Sometimes the way life throws complicated situations and how we're navigating this thing called life. I am an artist from the deep, deep south. Grew up in Denver, Colorado, partly born in Denver, Colorado, moved to the newly integrated south at the age of nine and grew up around racism and inequality and hatred and bigotry and went off to college, studied at the Art Institute of Atlanta, dropped out of college. I am a college dropout. I'm happy to say it. I don't have a student loans, but anyway, you know, I'm just a creative, frustrated. And now in my ripe old age of 51, I am just finding my voice to, to alleviate some of the stress and trauma that we live through in the South. You know, and just that just in the South, but all over the country. And so using art has been a way for me to to live and express myself. And and so I'm an artist, I'm a creative, I'm a businesswoman, I'm a sister, I'm a aunt, I'm a daughter, and you know, I'm a creative extremist. That's what I call myself. The Dr. King said with the South of the world and what makes me more of a creative extremist. And I, I consider myself that. So how did I find you? Through TikTok. I follow this black, I don't think he's a doctor yet. I, I don't know how it, how it works, but I follow him and then he highlighted your three sculptures. And I went down this rabbit hole and I found your website, Mothers of Gynecology. The three sculptures is Anarka, Betsy, and Lucy. Mm-hmm. And I was ignorant. I didn't even know there was a father of gynecology, nonetheless mothers of it. Further down a rabbit hole, you guys are fundraising to get this clinic designed and built. Hence, I gotta have you on the podcast. Buried in an article I was reading about the story. I want to get deeper into your design process with these three women as, as well as the efforts 
of creating this clinic. And it's not just the clinic, correct? It's the whole campus that was curating to welcome guests to Montgomery, but for people that are specifically coming here to learn the history because of our neighbors, there's this massive museum and memorial to the wrenched and marginalized. And, uh, and we're literally a half block from the National Memorial for Peace and Justice. And so the property that we have is black owned, black operated, you know? And so basically I, I felt a calling to do something with the property that I've inherited and my siblings inherited from living parents that has been working to help the marginalized or downtrodden, but formerly incarcerated at Homewood. And so, and so with that, here we are, it's the, it's the whole campus that the Mothers of Gynecology, the monument was erected on. So your family owns that property. Is that, is that's what I heard you say? My father, mm-hmm. as a matter of fact, so we moved to Alabama in 1979. When I went away to college at the age of 17, my, my father, he's the first Black prison chaplain that was appointed by George Wallace, they were facing stay tomorrow forever, according to my black daddy to be the first black prison chaplain. And my father saw what was happening to black people in prison. And of course, you know, we have white people in prison as well, but disproportionately the population is of black and brown people. And he just noticed that like at the end of a sentence, at, when you serve your 21 years, if you don't have a home plan, an address to go to in the state of Alabama, they would plan to keep you in prison. And so my father would say, you know, he's like, this is not right. And he would start bringing prisoners, these formerly incarcerated murderers and thieves and prostitutes and drug dealers. And he would bring them home with him and they became our friends and babysitters and would sleep alongside in the next bedroom and or on the floor with us. And so as time went on, he acquired these properties to house and support the homeless and formerly incarcerated people. So on the more campus, there's a 28-bed facility where we can have medical practitioners or doulas and midwives to come to Montgomery, learn the history, stay a couple of days. And then there's also what we call the Creative Change Makers Museum, which is a space where you can learn more about, you know, Black joy and how did people survive? How did Black people survive during a time of racial terror? They created spaces like juke joints and speaking where they can go and relieve themselves and have some sort of joy. So that's going to tell the story along with my family story. Aurelia Browder, Browder v. Yale, the end of the Montgomery bus boycott is, is also a family member. So there's spaces that we want to curate to tell the history, but also bring some life and healing and joy into the space in the midst of all of the trauma that Black people have had to endure. This has been like a burden to you. I don't want to say burden, but it's it's a calling. When I was 18 years old, I went to the Art Institute of Atlanta. First of all, I I have to preface this with saying I was in jail. I was suspended from the high school all the time simply because I was a fighter. You know, I was always tall, had good diction, you know, I wasn't all Southern, but I had a bit of good diction and was teased a lot and watched a lot of my friends who were teased and I found myself fighting a lot. And, and so I can remember immediately my father saying, you know, I last expected he was like, you're not going to sit here and watch the Oprah all day. You're going to get up and you're going to do something with your life. And so he brought home eight t-shirts and 10 tubes of paint. And he said, figure it out. Just sit here and think about what you're doing. And then when I went off to college, I went to the Art Institute of Atlanta and there was a painting of J. Mary and Sam in the three girls and three women. And it's a very popular painting with Robert Tom. He was an artist that was commissioned by Park Davis, which is really Pfizer today, to create 45 pieces of artwork, commissioned work to show early medicine or great moments in medicine. And this artist depicted an Arthur Lincoln Beckett. Stoic Black women who were been behind the scene and one is on the table and I'm going somewhere with it because it kind of leads into where we are now. And on at my professor on his desk was a postcard for Robert of Robert Tom's painting of Jamie Arian Sims' Great Moments in Medicine. And when I went to him and asked him, I said, number one, why is this on your on your desk? I was curious. And I said, what is this? What 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 did he picture me? And basically he told me to figure it out myself. You know, he's very um Darkie and his comment. And 
and at the time I was living in Atlanta and there's this place called the Shrine of the Black Madonna. I don't know if you've ever heard of it, but it's known for teaching black history and the, you know, the African diaspora. And at the age of 18, I was jerked that he told me to figure it out because that's where I went to learn the history of these women and, and, and you know, the slave trade and the slave trade. And so long story short, I wind up getting expelled because my, not expelled, but I was told he failed my portfolio. My instructor failed me because my portfolio, my portfolio was too black. And in my portfolio, I had the three women in our community and I reimagined who they were and what they must have been like, but I created them in dance and rhythmic and music and gave them back their heritage. And I was basically kicked out of college for that. Wow. And but yeah, but it was at that time, at the age of 18, one year older than Anarka herself, mm-hmm. I said to myself, I will do something to honor these women in some capacity. And so my whole, my whole portfolio was an arc of in 1991. And I forgot about it, you know, as I went on about my life, was very successful in business. And then we got a call from our mother here in Montgomery, Alabama, that told me, we need your help here. The ministry is growing and we need some support. You're PR and you're doing, you know, you went to college for, you know, <laughs> All of this wouldn't come home and help us. And I was like, heck no. I'm so it took me another two years. I was like, I'm not going to Mississippi, goddamn Alabama is part of that. And I'm like, I'm not doing it. And so like two years later, I decided to make a track in 2002. But when I came to Montgomery, when I moved here, the father of Ghana was standing at our state chapel. And I was triggered all over again. So and they erected the that statue at that time or? Oh, it, the statue had been there since 1939, erected by the Medical Association for the State of Alabama. He stands directly in front of our state capitol that was built by enslaved African men, women, and children. And he stands there and has been there since 1939. And no one has questioned and or tried to remove him. I think there was one group that, that no one took them seriously that kind of tried to draw some attention to him. But, you know, until now, and so when I started giving tours as a means to, you know, I started, I opened up a tour company. Number one, nobody in Montgomery in Alabama was doing it to the level that I was. I, you know, bought a, a 20 passenger bus and I started giving these tours. And every time I went by that painting, or excuse me, the statue, I made sure that people knew who this man was, what he did to these girls, because they were girls, they were 16, 17, as young as nine, 18 years old. I wanted people to know that there's a monster standing at our state capital, built by enslaved African women, the capital told. And so it just became a thing. And, and so during COVID, I was like, you know what? I'm going to die here as an artist if I don't do something. So for that audience who don't know, what are we talking about here? A brief history of why it's so important to say Anarka, Betsy, and Lucy. This gentleman who was from South Carolina, moved to Montgomery, Alabama, opened up a hospital. Right now, during that time, Black women were having babies, you know, and, you know, let's talk about that part, that portion that Black women or the children would inherit the condition of the mother. So if the mother was enslaved, the child was born enslaved. So you know, the fistula, which is a hole in the bladder from obstructed labor, would form formulate, which would cause leakage in the bladder. And basically, it's the tearing down of the tissue that, that leaves the hole. Well, it was common with the enslaved Black girls, right? And basically, plantation owners would then bring their property or take their property to a them who framed it them. And in that sense, he became a, a major law, if you will. He would experiment on these Black bodies, on these Black girls, on Black men and Black children. Ultimately, he killed several of them. He would use forceps wrongly. And basically, he murdered a lot of these women, but he also mangled them. But he had cured, you know, he claimed to have cured Anarcha. Anarcha had 30 surgeries. She was 17. He opened up a, what they call the Negro Hospital right there on 33 South Street. He owned a lot of property in that area. And this doctor just began experimenting on these Black girls, claiming that he could 
fix the cold that will cause a constant leak of urine and or fecal matter. And, and ultimately, and our school was never cured, she had 30 surgeries. Okay, so there were 11 women that we know of based upon him, his own memoir, but three of them that he talked about the most, which was an archaeological investment. So this man became famous throughout the world, throughout the country, and they considered him, or when I say they, the medical community deemed him as the father of modern gynecology. And, you know, according to books like Christopher Owens, who wrote Medical Bondage, there were other doctors who were, you know, doing the same type of procedures. But this man, for some reason, was given the title, the father of gynecology. And again, back when I was giving these tours and when I would look at that, that plaque that would say he's the father of gynecology, I would think, well, where are the mothers? It's their father. You, you must have mothers somewhere. Or where are the children that you, you know? It became a quest for me. For seven years, I had this paper mache woman that a gentleman created for me. He was like, what are you going to be doing in the next five years? And I told him that I really wanted to start honing in on the untold history in Montgomery, Alabama of healthcare and gynecology that Black women uh, forcibly contributed to in this space. So for every year, I would have this event called Art on the Square. And the square is actually the, the market where Black people were bought, sold, and traded in the heart of our city. And I would put up this paper mache in Arca. And she's looking towards heaven. She had tears in her eyes. And I would leave her out there on the street and leave pamphlets and information for people to walk up and just learn of the history, right? And so it's been an eight-year journey with that. And then, you know, here we are challenging them or, or reimagining what monuments should be and what they should look like and what stories they should be. The condition is called fascial vaginal vesicular. Uh, yeah, it's a vesicular vaginal fistula. Vesicular. Yeah, but this particular one is in, in the vaginal area and it happens during childbirth or if there's some obstruction there. And it, so again, it's a whole. And, you know, during that time, there were no x-rays. There were no precisions and robots. So you can kind of slide in an instrument. SIMS is also known for the SIMS retractor. And, you know, these are instruments. We went to a warehouse here in Montgomery, Alabama, bought a, a pewter spoon, bent the spoon, woke up out of a dream one night and said, you know, I can take this spoon and, and insert it into the cervix and open it up and I'll be able to see like I've never seen before. And so he was creating tools and some of, of which the design they still use today. Yeah. So basically it's just this whole story that took place in my hometown, Montgomery, Alabama, that no one was talking about. And it's fascinating because Black women are at the center of this story in our body. I'm still at, you had these women in your mind for mm -hmm. 20, 30 years. 32. 32 years. How did you, their, their images, because, because again, like what I said earlier, like there are no photographs of them. Mm -hmm. Well, I can only imagine what an African or a descendant from Africans look like. You know, it doesn't take much the stretch of the imagination. And so as girls growing up, we braid our hair. So Anarcha has braids three braids that come out and most of most of pictures that you see of of enslaved women or girls are here it's tied or you know restricted i wanted to give them back that identity because you know black women our hair is our identity right mm -hmm. and so basically i wanted to create an image that was opposite of what we've been conditioned to see with these black women, you know, in antebellum, torn and tattered clothing with their hair wrapped. I wanted to show the braids. So Anarka has three braids in her hair at the age of 17. One of the mothers, the sculptor, has cornrows going straight back that I made out of door Henry. And another mother has bicycle chains at band two knot, you know, to show different personalities in different cultures in these structures. So, but when you look at the Robert Tom painting, you see a white man's point of view from his 
thought of what a, or of what these women girls look like, right? So I think here, let's go back to our roots, you know, but, and so that's what I did. I created identity for them, you know, and the trauma that they went through. As a matter of fact, in our faith, it has perforated metal that looks like it's been ripped or scarred in some capacity. So I really put a lot of thought in what I wanted them to look like. And they're actually standing naked and are six feet tall. The other two are 12 and nine feet tall and they're naked. If you look very closely, you will see that the Antarctica, her, her eyes, and you know, I could only wonder what their time, those three and a half years, they were used as experiments. I could only wonder what they were thinking, you know, so I could, Imagine someone had to cry out for help, you know, with this excruciating pain. As a matter of fact, Lucy had been written in the memoir, in the memoir, and, you know, crying out in agony and in pain. Mm. Even though the notion was that Black women had a high tolerance for pain and or we didn't feel pain at all or that our nerve endings experienced pain differently. But yet he wrote in his memoir that these women cried out in agony and in pain. So, you know, it's just a very interesting thing. So I wanted to bring that to to the space along with their jewelry. The first week I was in San Francisco, I rented out what is called the box shop and hired three fabricators to help me with this project. And the first thing I designed and created was their necklaces and their adornment, you know. So you see Anarchy has the Adinkra symbol of, you know, God is the praise, the geomancy. And then her earrings are made of thing, you know, the, the symbols. And I just, I put a lot into just making sure that I honored them. And I know, you know, there's no pain or no dignity in pain, but, you know, we come, as Black people, we come from a strong lineage of people that were able to endure racial lynching and terror. And yeah, so I don't want to over talk to you, but just the, the thought process in creating these these girls, I wanted them to look youthful, but then give them some dignity and respect. How long did it take you to do Anarcha, for example? The way I found, I had to talk about my team because the way I found them was during COVID, you know, everybody's in the house, but prior to January of 2020, I took a trip to, to Hawaii. And on my way back from Hawaii, I stayed with some friends in San Francisco. I call them Japanese. One is Jewish and one is Japanese and they're married. And I was with them in, in a place called Hayes Valley in San Francisco. And there was a big, tall, 15-foot statue named Tara, like the, the Buddhist goddess Tara. And I turned that corner and I just remember looking up and thinking, this is what Anarcha needs to look like. She needs to command people's attention because this is beautiful metal piece made of bicycle chains and all types of metal. It was just absolutely beautiful. And when you look at the base of the, this monument that was put up, there was no name. There was nobody name. There was no way to reach out to the artist. And so my Japanese friends were at a Jewish theater and across from them was a woman who actually worked on the statue that I was just in love with. Tyra. So like three weeks later, my friends call me and they're like, Michelle, we found the artist that created that. Would you like to have a conversation? And I was like, no, I'm already starting my project. It's great. It's no problem. I'll be finished with it. You know, it's going to take me about eight to, to 10 months. I said, well, let's just have a conversation with her and see what she's going to say. And had a conversation and that conversation lasted for about a year. And then at the end of the year, I said, okay, what doesn't look like anything's going to happen here. So let me move on to my project. And she says, you know what? Her name is Dana Albany. She's a Burning Man artist. She's like, I'll, I'll help you with your project. I'll help you. So she says, there's a price tag. So I had to pay her. I had to pay her and, and hire two other fabricators and rent out a shop. And it was just a whole big production. And she said, send me your, your art and we're going to get you ready. Come stay with us for a month or so. And by the time you leave here, you're going to be ready to weld. And so she actually taught me how to weld in a month and two weeks. And when I came back to Montgomery, I had the head of Antarctica, half of it, wasn't even a full 
head and a half hair legs. I had skeletons for both of the mothers. They came in like nine different boxes. So we had to pack everything up. Um, but she gave me and they taught me enough to, to get started or to finish the piece. And it took me from March of 2021 to September 2021. Completely interacted. On the screen, a video that I got off of your website. And I just want to, I freeze this frame specifically because I wanted to talk about the landscape. And when I saw the approach to it briefly through this, and I had to use my imagination because I'm not in Montgomery, unfortunately, it's kind of like a campfire almost. Like you have these chairs surrounding the three women. It looks like a wooden base, but it's pretty, it's it's circular. It reminds me of a, like you took a tree and you cut it like really thinly, a thin slice of a tree. Was that the idea or? No, that is a concrete base. Oh, okay. I didn't have the support and or the funding that I needed to to really start this project. So what I did was I took part of my savings and that, that, what I used to rent the box off and get things started. And I raised money through selling bricks, commemorating or honoring a family member, a doctor, a doula, a nurse, and people. So I had two size bricks that you could, and, and I raised $65,000 off of bricks, t shirts, and Zoom. Yeah. And so that's the concrete base and around the base. There's a, you know, Girl Trek bought a, a, a brick. The Jewish Workman Circle, they bought a brick. So when you do $500 bricks and $300 bricks, it adds up. And so that's the base that honors, you know, people, family members and friends um, that people bought. So it's a concrete base. And on the outer circle, at a, the outer sphere has these beautiful bricks that honor women, women and children. And then there's seating around it. Is is it a you know, to, to tell people the story. Oh yeah, absolutely. It's a place of healing to be quite honest with you. Once you hear the story, you you really cannot believe that these women suffered through this. And number two, you're kind of in disbelief that you've never heard of this story in, in its entirety of women and experimentation of the Alabama official experiment. It, you, you just, you've never heard of it. And so I want people to sit and look at this monument because there's so much to look at. This piece is that I call stowage, where it's the outline. I don't know if you've seen like the transatlantic slave trade, but the illustration of these boats, the white lion and all of these boats that were coming over the bodies and how they were positioned inside the belly of the ships. Those bodies are in the thighs and in the, the vaginal area. There's outlines of those. And so there's hands coming through the actual fistula, the hole that's there. And so I wanted people to be able to sit and just look. And there's such a story there to set. And the silk suture that Sims used tells the story around Lucy's leg of wire silk sutures that he would use to stitch and, you know, to mangle these women, their insides. And those stitches of the wire sutures would also set up gain grain and all types of infection. Mm-hmm. In fact, you can look at Lucy's legs and you'll see the wire, what I call the silk sutures. And you can, as a matter of fact, on Lucy, Lucy is the one on the on the right-hand side if you're facing the monitoring net. She has land two knots. So there's a straightening comb. There's a curling iron, which was used during the day for folks who don't know that curling iron and straightening comb was used to colonize even our hair, you know, the way our appearance from wearing the, the pinky and coil uh, hair to straightening the hair. And so you can find that in her body. So each one of these bodies, there's a story to tell, but you have to sit and look at it. As a matter of fact, Betsy on the left-hand side, I wanted her to have a couple of tattoos. So Betsy has tattoos of Mama, you know, Big Mama Thornton, who was ripped off by Elvis. You know, ain't I let hound dog, blah, blah, blah. He mm-hmm. went and... Watch this woman, this Black woman in Alabama sing, and he mimicked her words and her song. And so her name is on Becky. Women like Oprah Winfrey or Tamika Mallory, you know, bringing it into the future. These are women who have stories in birthing justice and 
so Betsy is pregnant and she tells the story of, you know, women like Kiara Johnson who lost her life in 2016 from simply not being believed that something was wrong with her as she bled to death on the table, you know, after giving birth from a routine cesarean. There's women like um, Oni Lee Logan, you know, one of the last midwives that practiced midwifery here in Alabama in 1976. It was outlawed. She was the last midwife to practice until I knew Stephanie Mitchell, who one of the first Black women to practice and now in the state of Alabama. So each one of these mothers tell a story, a very unique story from the past to the present. So women like Rita Franklin is on the air. And yeah, so we, I just tried to honor them as best as I know how and then honor the women today, you know, like a Don Wooten who actually blew the whistle on the sterilization cases that were happening at the women like the Ralph sisters who were sterilized in 1973. So, you know, I, I wanted to create a piece of art that was historical, that could teach you the history and also show you how today, even at Serena Williams, who's a powerful Black woman who's known throughout the world, nearly lost her life. Although she's married to a white billionaire, nearly lost her life because no one believed her. Right. You know? So this Dorothy Calvert. So this monument is a teaching tool. It's a way to, you know, have people to sit and reckon with the history, but also ask the question, how do we heal? And then how do we go on to heal others? And so that's why you have the chair around that people can just sit and really take this in. So you're creating a healing campus as a transition into architecture. Mm -hmm. So the article that I read, it sounds like you already hired or consulted with an architecture firm. Is that correct? Yes, we consulted with Matt, um, have been in conversation with them for about 10 months about the possibilities of, you know, hiring them to uh, help us with the project. It's still, we're still in top. There's nothing that's concrete as of yet because, you know, there's there's some other opportunities that are out there that we're looking at in terms of, but, you know, we we live in a state with one of the greatest architecture schools in HBCU, which is Perkins University. Come on now. That, yeah. warmed, that warmed my, and so you have warmed my heart. You understand. Like, I, uh, yes. Yes, you do. Yeah. So, you know, I had to take a step back. You know, Mass is an amazing architect firm. You know, mm -hmm. you've heard of them. And, and so basically, but I thought, you know, this is Black-owned land, built by Black-owned dollars, but Black woman hands. I need to seek out the, the George Washington Carver in the book of T. Washington and, and see and have a conversation. So we've been talking uh, about their role in this and so uh, there's nothing that's concrete yet but you know i'm looking looking at my options and it would be amazing to have a black hbcu to get get hope and send it to them send it to them tell them that we need them on this project but we we're talking about it you know yes yes mm -hmm. yes how do you feel about architects how do you feel about your conversation i don't want to get too deep but just in general like on your side like how do you do you like us like do you like why do we do this like any questions at all like what I want to know how you feel about it of how I feel about architects yeah architects or even the process I think more importantly the process you know I wanted to be one oh. I went to draft school and everything I, yeah that was my trade in high school I, I went for drafted but girl the math I just could not grab them. You know, I'm going out. I just couldn't do it. <laughs> so, so basically, no, I, I, I think that architects, when you look back at the people that built this nation, mm -hmm. they built wells and bridges and the black hands and black blood that was filled. And I'm just going to take it from my home state of Alabama, the state's capital that was built by enslaved African people. The architecture that people come from all over the country right now today to look at the interlocking steps the spiral staircasing that a black man made with his own hand that he curated, not just the, the staircasing, but the columns and the bridges during the Civil War. It was black folks. It was black hands that did that. And so I just, I, you know, architecture 
is an amazing craft and we need more, you know, we need more Booker T's and more Kajor's Washington Carver's. We need more architects. As a matter of fact, when you drive through downtown Montgomery, there are some, I have a trolley, like a, a little red trolley that I, I bought. And in the window is a brick that was made by the hands of Black women. So when I think of the architect sector in my own city, I see Black people, Black bodies, Black hands, the handiwork of Black folks all around us. So yeah, mm. I have a passion for, for black, black folks, Black architects and architects in general because, you know, they're builders of not only that, of our freedom, right? And so with that, I'm a, I'm a fan. Yay. Do you have any ideas of how do you want a building with a space to look or how you want to integrate welding, I guess, or maybe some, some coroness? I don't know. I'm sure you've been dreaming about this, right? Like any, any ideas you want to share? Well, let's start with the campus because I did acquire the building of the space where in our solution that we were tormented, but the building that's there now, I think, was erected in 1867. So it would have been after the, the mothers were gone. But in terms of the space, the campus, I, I, I've been to Africa before, but in the architecture part of so I bought this, what they call a, what I call a sheet sheet. It's like one of those prefab buildings and it's on our property. I have two of them that's on the property. So to make it look as if you're in a, a shanty, a little low house, if you will, like on the plantations or sharecropping houses that folks would live in. And so with that, I wanted to create a space that took me back into time. And, and, and so it, I think I've kind of, accomplish that along with the the crusher run and the color of the soil that we picked to, to go in the space. And then, so basically, I just want to create an oasis, if you will, something similar to an oasis that would put you in mind of Africa. Like if you're in one of those places in Sierra, Sierra you know, absolutely, and or, or Ghana, or if you're in Nigeria, in the, in the jungle, right? So if you look at the architecture and the, the palm trees and how everything is situated, I wanted people to get the feel as if they were, you know, in one of those countries on the continent. Mm -hmm. And so, yeah, absolutely. And so even with the, the architecture of the, the two spaces the, on the campus, it has to be all centered in African architecture, if you will. You know, just the way the color and the positioning, the furniture, and the palm trees. And, you know, I just want that whole feel mm -hmm. her, uh, at home base. Yeah. And definitely you, you have the, the weather for it, for sure. Oh, yeah. To, to, to accomplish an, an outdoor space and indoor type thing. Oh, my gosh. I could just, just, just the creative juices is, is going. Um, about the process, I keep saying process, but because 10 months is a long time. Mm -hmm. Mm. Okay. 32 years is a long time. Because remember, I, I met these women when I was 18. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. How is your mental health in all this? You've read a lot of stuff that's terrifying. How are you? Well, so mind you, it was during COVID when I started building. So this monument was my lifesaver, if you will. I was already somewhat in a depressed state. You know, you can't give to it. You can't do your business. There was no way to have any interaction on the outside for that first year. Remember, 2020 was. And so for me, it was, it plays my life. As a creative, we have to do something. We have to be busy. Or for my, I'm speaking for myself as a creative, oftentimes we go through depression. We go through, we have a lot of anxiety. And I can say that because I know several artists who go through the same thing. And so for me, the mother was a lifeline. And to, to keep my mind creating in the midst of trauma and people dying and the uncertainty of our future. 
the mother saved my life because I had something to concentrate on. You know what I'm saying? I'm single. I, I live alone. And so basically it, it was it was something that I needed to do. So, but again, so it moved me out of my depression into giving birth to a conversation and a, a world conversation. People all over the country have heard about the mothers now and we're raising money for our project to, you know, such as the conference that we have coming up. And of course, the, the clinic, the space that we want to, to create for healing and transformation and reconciliation. Speaking of the conference, which is February 26th to March 1st, 2023. Yeah. How did you get her? This is Nicole Hannah Jones. Oh my gosh. Like, how did uh, you? Did she, did, this is like, she was your number one list, obviously, and is, ugh. Well, so I met Nicole Hannah-Jones when she was here in Montgomery at the National Memorial for Peace and Justice. She was called in. She was at a, an event there. And when I saw, I was driving my trolley, and I saw her walking down the street. I said, that lady is not from here. And this, I didn't know who she was. <laughs> um, I didn't know who she was, Nicole, but. Uh, her name, I, I wanted to honor her in some capacity because of the UNC Chapel Hill situation. And then also just her spirit, the fact that she is such a, a force to reckon with, I wanted to honor her. So her name is under the armpit of uh, Becky. And mm. she's one of those women giving birth to freedom and justice in education. And so I asked her if she would be our keynote speaker and this woman was so gracious and she said, absolutely. And she's going to be our keynote speaker on an Archelisi Becky day. And her, her platform is, you know, creating pathways to truth in education. You know, she's a Pulitzer Prize winner. And a New New York Times journalist, but also the creator of the 1619 Project. And I, I just love the fact that she's giving birth, you know, with her Freedom School, with her movie, with her her documentary, her docuseries. And it's all about freedom. Because once you know the truth, you're free. But then you have to free others. And so I just, I'm an admirer of her work. And we are somewhat in the same circle. And so... I was able to meet her on, on several occasions. It's been a, a light. And, you know, again, this is this is the artistry in you. Everything in here is purposeful. And even this right here, right, I'm highlighting it. It's like the remix to that painting you were talking about, correct? Yes, yes. It's the remix to the film, the father, the great mm -hmm. moment in medicine. And, but what if they were? So this is from a Black woman's perspective and point of view. So what if the tables will turn? It hits a little differently, right? And so this piece is called You May Feel a Little Pressure, which is when you go to the gynecologist and you sit with them and the first thing they say to you is you may feel a little pressure or, you know, the instruments may be cold or scooch down a little. So these are just some of the, the wording, some of the colloquialisms that you use when you go to gynecologist. And I wanted to take the, the statue and place them in a setting as if they were here today. So, and Arca has tattoos. She has her tattoo, her the bigger symbol on her arm, and she's holding the speculum, right? And Kim yeah. is there on the table, half naked, ready for the women to examine him. And then you have the midwife and doula in the middle. She, her hair is wrapped, but she also represents Lucy. And then Becky is the one with the cornrows, and she's pregnant. And across her chest says respect right okay. and so two doctors who would have been in their position now peeping behind the sheet to see what are they going to do to him you know what 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 is this like so we creating pathway to confront the injustices in healthcare and reproductive rights and justice and reparations you know we want to talk about how do we repair this that which is broken our mm -hmm. healthcare system is broken, you know? And so with that, this conference was the second one. The first one we had was 21. I didn't know 150 folks were going to show up. I just wanted to create a, a space where people can come and learn. And really, it was so random that we did this. And, and people from all over came. It was beautiful. 
um, but it was mixed with the arts. I believe that art integrated with you know, the architecture alongside a uh, feeling will have a greater outcome. So with that, the space that we're going to create the clinic will be a museum integrated with art in the space where patients can come and see a doula or a midwife or a primary care physician. So that's, yeah, there's a lot going on over here. <laughs> so can I just tell you who else is coming? We have, of course, the Cole Hannah Jones, but we also have Alicia Maybank, the American Medical Association. She's a Black woman in that space talking about how there must be a reckoning on race and health care and health equity. And so she's a keynote speaker on one day. We have Dr. Veronica Pendentel, who's the OBGYN, or she's a gynecologist. And then there's a midwife named Stephanie Mitchell, Dr. Stephanie Mitchell, one of our first Black midwives since 1976. Oh, you have the whole thing. Go ahead, girl. Uh, um, none other than Richard Cooper Owens, professor who you know, wrote the book Medical Bondage. We have Tia Lawson, who's with Dona, uh, the Doers International, that will speak with us along with none other than this woman is a New York Times journalist and author. She wrote a book called Under the Skin that talks about the Ralph sisters and talks about the inequities in our healthcare system and what her father experienced. He had Charles Johnson. Charles Johnson, his wife was Kara Johnson. She's the one who lost her life. He mm. tells her. Yeah. He talks about how one of the things that Kira said to him was don't, you know, don't be too aggressive because they may not treat me, you know, because we're black people, right? And then what is it, 16 hours later, she bleeds out because nobody believed her when she said that, you know, she was leaving consciousness. And so Charles Johnson will be with us on March 1st to talk about creating pathways to changing policy in health care. You know, that we need to we need to know who do we talk to, how do we do this? So the Mommy Bus Act, you know, so they're creating ways of um using the story to change narratives. And that's JC Hallman will talk more about his fan arc. He did a deeper dive. There's our doctor, uh, Veronica Pimentel. Yep. And yeah, she's gonna be speaking with us. And she's actually the architect of an Arthur Lucy Becky Day that she did with her colleagues at ACOG. She presented this, the idea to have a day to reckon with this history. I heard about it and I was like, if anybody going to do it, we're going to do it first in Montgomery, Alabama. <laughs> <laughs> and so now she's a speaker. She's going to be coming every year, big partner with us. And then those two women, the Ralph sisters, were the ones that were sterilized mm-hmm. in the abuse. And Ralph D. Weinberger, and it's 50 years this year that they won their case, but no reparations. We need to have a have conversation about how we can repair that. And, and then you have Professor Professor Delisa Alfred there at the bottom, who is a historian who's been talking about Sam. We started talking about him around the same time. And she's now teaching policy in her cla- in her college classroom. Yeah. So, so this besides, is an, it's more than a conference. It's more, yes. It's more and, than and, and you even have tours, correct? You even have a tour? Yeah, you know, I take a tour on February 27th. We're going to tour the hospital, the city of St. Jude, uh, which was a Negro hospital that was opened by the, ca- the, ca- the Catholic Church, the Archdiocese out of Mobile. And it was a place where Black people can could receive health care. And there's a couple of places that I want to take people and and have honest dialogue about what this history really means, but then draw it to the future and what's happening with us now. Anything else you want to talk about or have any? Talk so much. That's the whole point is for you to talk. Well, thank you. You know, this project is forever evolving and we are in a capital campaign right now, you know, to make sure that we're able to the task, which is to create a healing space for people, for women to end the healthcare crisis that we're in right now, and especially in our state. Our infant mortality rate is high and our mothers are dying from the lack of quality and equitable health care. So uh, that's the mission moving forward for the next 15 to 20 years. And I really hope uh... Black female architect. 
is on board. To yeah, well, I'm to some and yeah, absolutely. We've been talking to quite a few. I can't wait to like talk to you again about your the new campus that was just built. So absolutely, you should come. I I would like to come. Yes. <laughs> Time off and that. money. That's the only <laughs> thing. Darn. That's wedding me. I know. This is the nine to five. <laughs> but yeah, because I, I really want to see. I really want to physically see this. I've been to. Been to Alabama before. For, mm-hmm. for an interview, actually. But unfortunately, it didn't work out. But yeah. Was, yeah. A lot of things here, the Legacy Museum, the local park museum, yeah, Freedom Riders. There's a lot of rich history here. Mm-hmm. Uh, and then there's architecture by our ancestors, enslaved and women and children, that you can physically click your hand on the bricks today. There's some bricks that have the actual fingerprint and grafted in the stone. Amazing. Thank you so much, Michelle, for coming on the podcast. Thank you for having me. Hey, listeners. I have an exciting announcement. I decided to launch a membership program for the show where you have a chance to support me and the show directly. I love creating the show, and it means the world to me that you all tune in to keep hearing me week after week. But it takes an immense amount of time and energy to produce. I want to keep the show going. And I want to invest in this growth. And I also want you to become a partner with me in this journey. That's why I'm excited to give you a chance to officially become a supporter of the show at glow.fm slash archispolly, A-R-C-H-I-S-P-O-L-L-Y, or by clicking the link in the show notes. It's quick and easy. It takes less than 30 seconds and just takes clicking a link in the show notes and using Apple or Google Pay. You don't have to create any new logins and you can contribute as much or as little as you like. If this show is part of your day or week and you like what I'm doing, then visit glow.fm slash archespolly, all one word, and support me and the show in any way you can today.